Good afternoon. My name is Tom Beaker, and I'd like to welcome you to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Brown Bag Lecture Series held here at the Museum of Nebraska History on the third Thursday of every month. A detail, a detailed uh, uh, schedule of this series, as well as other information about the Historical Society's programs, can be found on our website, which is www.nebraskahistory.org. Before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for funding for the filming of these lectures. Their financial support also allows us to tape and broadcast these programs on public access television. This year marks the 150th anniversary of the Homestead Act, one of the most significant laws passed in the history of the United States. To commemorate this event, our speaker today is Blake Bell, historian at Homestead National Monument in Beatrice. Mr. Bell is particularly interested in the Homestead Act of 1862 and subsequent land laws. Blake is going to talk today about what was going on in Nebraska in the period prior to the passage of the Homestead Act. Blake. Thank you, Tom. Um, and I'd like to also thank the Nebraska State Historical Society for having me up here today. Um, the title of my talk is Fighting for the Homestead. This talk is really about a parallel history that's going on here. Yes, I will be talking about Nebraska, but in order to talk about Nebraska, we have to talk about Washington, D.C. as well. So we're going to look at what was this dialogue and in some cases, why were there violent outbreaks taking place over this territory, this Nebraska territory, the public lands, if you will. And we are going to try to see how all of this changed with the passage of the Homestead Act in 1862 and other land legislation at that time. The use of public lands. This was a serious point of contention, uh, both in Washington, D.C. and in the territories. One of the issues, or the primary issue, was the issue of slavery. What, was go what, was the ter what were the territories going to look like? How were those territories going to be uh, settled, is what, the, what we're talking about. Who was going to get them? And this is the conversation. This conversation starts uh, shortly after the creation of the United States, and we start acquiring public lands. We're going to talk about what these public lands are. Where are they? Who controlled them? Why did they control them? Louisiana Purchase in 1803 is a good starting point. Uh, Thomas Jefferson acquires the Louisiana Territory from France, from Napoleon, and literally doubles the size of the United States overnight. And this idea of what are we going to do with that land begins. And I think most of us know he sends a couple guys out, take a look at it, they come back, Lewis and Clark, and tell him that not a whole lot out there. One of my favorite stories is when they get back, they only have a drawing or two of this vast area. And, they ask, and Thomas Jefferson asked him, why? You guys drew pictures of everything. Why so few of this area you say so big? And their response was, because everything looks the same. No matter what direction you're looking, everything looks the same. So this area becomes known as, uh, most of us know, as the Great American Desert is what they begin calling it. So what are we going to do with it? What are we going to do? Well, 20 years, 17 years goes by, and westward expansion is slowly but surely moving towards our uh, Mississippi River and beyond. And areas are becoming populated, but we have a problem. What is going to happen when those lands become so populated that they're going to be able to apply for statehood? Well, to keep the balance of power, they decide to admit Missouri as a slave state, even though it is above the traditional Mason-Dixon line 
and admit Maine as a free state. This way they're going to maintain this balance of power, political balance of power in Washington. And the Missouri Compromise says <clears throat> that all this other unorganized territory is not going to be, uh, or it's going to be free from here on out above the Mason-Dixon line and uh, the territories that we do not have yet, well, we're just gonna deal with that later. We're just postponing this discussion is what they're really doing. Henry Clay, get familiar with him. We're gonna be talking about him in a few more minutes. Uh, he is the one who comes up with this idea, the great compromiser, Henry Clay. And Missouri's going to be the uh, slave state, Maine's gonna be the uh, free state. And this slavery ban is going to be following this latitude line here. Frederick Merck said in 1978 that by 1820, slavery was apologized for as an evil to be alleviated by spreading it out thin over the West. I happen to disagree with Mr. Merck, Dr. Merck, I'm sorry. Actually, the Missouri Compromise just postponed the inevitable. What was coming? He did, they did the exact same thing that the revolutionary governments did. They just postponed it and they put it off. In fact, in the 1830s, you see gag orders being placed in, um, in, in Congress. Uh, the Pickney resolutions that come down say that Congress isn't even going to talk about slavery. We're not even going to look at petitions that are against slavery from the abolitionist movement. We're just not even gonna talk about it. So this is where we're at right now when we're talking about these things. <clears throat> but let's get the rest of the public lands. Let's get moving forward here. The next two decades, the United States, through war, through treaty, they acquire uh, the Mexican, or they acquire the desert Southwest and they acquire the Pacific Northwest. Mexican-American War, 46, 48. You can see the lands that were seceded by Mexico. And uh, those resolutions that I talked about, the gag order resolutions, they expired in 1844. And when they were fighting the Mexican-American War, this uh, particular gentleman, Representative Wilmot from Pennsylvania, was a ardent abolitionist and he wanted to prevent slavery moving into those western territories and he tried to pull something kind of sneaky he wanted to add a uh, provision to the mexican uh, treaty that they were going to acquire in the mexican-american war notice we have the first one that he tries in 46 the war started in 46 so this is a, a very confident group of individuals that are writing this uh, treaty prior to the war even being over. And his provision would have banned that slavery. Well, the South caught it and they were very upset. This idea that, or this Northern conspiracy is in place in the South. It's the seed has been planted. They're talking about, look at what Representative Wilmot did. Well, he didn't stop in 46, he tried it again in 47, and he tried it again in 48. Every one of them, well, by 47 and 48, they were on to him and they caught it, but he wasn't going to stop. And uh, ultimately it did fail. Um, the political powers that be ensured that that provision was out of the treaty. The Oregon Treaty, 1846, we acquire the Oregon Territory, uh, not, too many issues going on here as far as slavery is concerned, but we are acquiring land and we are acquiring uh, more and more territory that needs to be discussed. By 1850, the continental United States looks very, very much like it does today. Washington DC has to decide. They now are in control from the Atlantic to the Pacific and there's got to be a conversation, an honest conversation that takes place. Who controls these territories? How are they going to be settled? <clears throat> Congress was responsible for administering these territories. And this is important. Congress is responsible for administering these territories, even to this day, because of this, the property clause that's written into our Constitution. Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2. 
stops at clause two. Keep that in mind. Congress shall have power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory or other property belonging to the United States. Very simple. Anybody who had challenged it in the past had all failed all the way through the Supreme Court. So Congress needed to decide what they were going to do. Quick look at the 30s and 40s. You have some booms and busts that are driving northern small farmers to the cities as the north is rapidly industrializing. Southern plant plantations are growing, especially King Cotton. They're getting more wealthy and uh, they're doing it off of slave labor. And both north and south economies are looking west. So it's not just political, it's economical too. What are we going to shape this West like? And this was the talk of the day. Manifest destiny. John O'Sullivan claims that it's our manifest destiny to overspread and possess the whole of the continent which Providence has given us. He says this in 1845. It's our manifest destiny. Whose manifest destiny? The North wants it to look the way they want it to look. The South wants it to look the way they want it to look. Whose manifest destiny is it? And how is it going to look? 1850s. This is an amazing time. Compromise of 1850 starts this all off. And it all has to center around California. What is California? It's applied for statehood. And is it going to be free or is it going to be slave? The South actually wanted to divide California in half, and the northern half was going to be North California, and it was going to be free. Southern half was going to be Southern California and going to be slave. Well, they conceded that the entire uh, state of California was going to be free, but they needed to have some pieces of legislation within this Compromise of 1850. By the way, this was Henry Clay, our great compromiser, again, coming up with this. He was great at putting off these issues for a while. The Fugitive Slave Act was agreed upon. Now, the Fugitive Slave Act we're going to talk about in just a moment, but essentially what this legislation did was said to the North that if slaves escape to the North, it is your responsibility, if you see them, to return them to the South. And you have to let our slave catchers in to go get them. So they're basically telling the North, you're participating in this, uh, in this industry. Utah and New Mexico territories granted popular sovereignty. Another great term of the day, popular sovereignty. Congress is in charge of the public lands. But popular sovereignty is saying, we're going to let you decide, let the people decide if you're going to have slave or you're going to have free economies. Then you have the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, one of uh, those events in history that you can really identify a lot of historians look at this and they'll say this was the beginning, the real beginning of the Civil War. Battles were fought, bleeding Kansas. I think most of us are familiar with John Brown and his uh, rampage throughout Kansas. And people were dying. They were literally killing each other, trying to ensure that their ideology was going to be uh, in place in those uh, territories, especially Kansas. Not so much in Nebraska. Nebraska, if I recall, only had about 15 to 20 slaves at this time, so it wasn't a huge issue, but Kansas border, most of its border was along Missouri. So Missouri is a slave state. They're pouring into this territory. Formation of the Republican Party really comes out of this Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. And um, they are dedicated to this idea of free soil. They are talking about giving the land away. We want free economies. We want free labor. Failed homestead legislation, 52, 54, 59, and 60. This conversation didn't just start in 1862. They didn't just decide we're going to give the land away. They're talking about this very early on. And in 52, doesn't even make it out of, Cong or out of the House. 
54 makes it to the Senate, fails. 59 makes it to the Senate, fails. 60, it actually passes both the House and the Senate, but President Buchanan vetoes it. So we have, uh, we have a very, very divided country with what's the, what this area is going to look like. Slavery, land, and expansion. It's dividing our country. I mentioned the Fugitive Slave Act. This is going to be a terrible pun, but it left a really bad taste in the mouth of many Northerners. They did not want to participate in this. And the Republican Party latched on to this in 1856. And it's actually the, one of the reasons why one of the most famous uh, pieces of literature of this day came out, and it would be uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Uh, she was in Cincinnati and witnessed this firsthand, the slave catchers coming and tearing families apart. And this uh, drove her to write this, uh, this expose, if you will, even though it was uh, fiction. But the, the Fugitive Slave Act made the Northerners, especially the abolitionists, feel like they were a part of this institution. And I mentioned the Kansas-Nebraska Act, Popular Sovereignty. This is what the Kansas-Nebraska Act really did. You can see here, opened up the Nebraska Territory and the Kansas Territory, and um, it also ended the Missouri Compromise, the legislation of the Missouri Compromise, because in order to uh, have the people decide, they had to table that legislation. They had to end it. So it, this is all coming to a head. And I have the quote, the famous quote, a house divided against itself cannot stand. How divided was this house against itself? Let's go to round one, 1856. Charles Sumner, Senator of Massachusetts, gives a wonderful lecture, talk on the Senate floor, showing people how terrible it was that they passed this Kansas-Nebraska Act because look at the violence that's going on out there is what he's telling the Senate. We need to repeal this. Preston Brooks does not like this. He is a representative from South Carolina. And one of the reasons he does not like this is because Senator Andrew Butler is his kin and Charles Sumner directly uh, talks about Senator Andrew Butler, and he is determined to say something to Charles Sumner. Well, his friend, Lawrence Kite here, uh, also a representative in South Carolina, is encouraging him to go say something to Charles Sumner, but make sure you take your cane with you. They get to the Senate floor, Charles Sumner's at his desk, and he is working, and uh, Preston Brooks says very little to him, and then starts waylaying on him with his cane. And he beats him, and beats him, and beats him on the floor of the Senate. Senators rush to help him, but our friend here, Lawrence Kite, is, or he pulls a pistol out, and he's holding off the rest of the senators saying, let them be. Charles Sumner can barely even move on the ground. And Senator Kite, or uh, Representative Kite here is saying, let them be. And he beats him so bad that he has to take three years of convalescent leave in order to heal from his wounds. Neither Representative Kite or Representative Brooks are arrested or censored by the Congress, and they go on caring about their business. And actually, when Brooks gets back to his native home in South Carolina, he finds about a hundred new canes waiting for him at his door. His cane had broke during the beating. That was the only reason it stopped. Round two. Two years later, our friend uh, Lawrence Kite is back, and um, Galicia Grow who happens to be the author of the Homestead Act, by the way. Now remember, the first fight was over the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Well, now this one is uh, taking place. It's late, about 3 o'clock in the morning. The Republican Party is filibustering the state of Kansas, being admitted as a slave state, and the 
representative who is speaking on behalf of the Republican Party is tired, about ready to fall asleep. Three in the morning, Galicia Grove, former uh, head of the committee for the territory, says, I'll take over. When he says this, Lawrence Kite says, you need to go back to your side of the aisle. Galicia Grove says, a slave driver will not crack his whip at me. At which Lawrence Kite politely responds by trying to choke him <laughs> and takes him down to the ground. But who else was involved in this? 50 other congressmen break out into a melee at 3 o'clock in the morning, and they are all fighting over Kansas being admitted as a slave state. This ended with several arrests this time, although no charges were ever brought up. But a house divided against itself cannot stand. And what are they arguing about? The territories, and they're arguing about slavery. What is that going to look like? Is it going to be given away for free, or are we going to sell this to the highest bidder? The election of 1860 pretty much ended this discussion. That's the map. It's not a map from 1860, but we get the idea. The blue up here is Abraham Lincoln. The green down here was his largest challenger, Breckenridge, and we all know the winner. This gentleman here becomes 16th president of the United States. The South was outraged. This is the night in Savannah, Georgia, that President Abraham Lincoln was elected. It was a massive revolt. And what you can't necessarily see here is this flag that's hanging up. Some of you might recognize it. It has become a popular flag that says, Don't tread on me, states' rights. That was raised above Savannah, Georgia that night. And then one of the cartoons from this era comes out shortly after. Notice who's lying on the ground there. That's Abraham Lincoln being smashed by what appears to be a Spartan, calling for war. These are the secession documents that came out of the South. The South was seceding. Here's what they're seceding for. These are what they're saying in their secession documents. This is South Carolina. The North demanded the application of the principle of prohibition of slavery to all of the territory acquired from Mexico and all other parts of the public domain. They're not letting us participate. They're not letting us go to these territories. We've given our soldiers, our money bought the Louisiana Territory, they're not letting us participate. This is a northern conspiracy to end slavery. Georgia, the prohibition of slavery in the territories is the cardinal principle of this organization. That's the whole reason for the Republican Party is what Georgia is saying. They're not allowing us to participate. Mississippi, it has grown until it denies the right of property and slaves and refuses protection to that right on the high seas, in the territories, and wherever the government of the United States has jurisdiction. They're cutting it off everywhere. Can't even have slaves on the high seas, according to Mississippi. That's the order in which they seceded. Notice, Texas, Louisiana, Georgia, Alabama, Florida, Mississippi, and South Carolina all seceded before President Abraham Lincoln was even taking the oath. This is the Constitution of the Confederate States of America. Brilliantly written on this Wonderful piece of paper. They hand scratched this down very, very quickly when they established the Confederate States of America. And remember that article that I told you about earlier. Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2 of the Constitution gives the right of Congress to administer the public lands. 
The Congress shall have all power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations concerning the property of the Confederate states, including the lands thereof. That was Clause 2. In the original Constitution, it ended at Clause 2. But they had a Clause 3. In all such territory, the institution of Negro slavery, as it now exists in the Confederate states, shall be recognized and protected by Congress and by the territorial government and the inhabitants of the several Confederate states. They want slavery in their territories. That's what they're saying. That's what they want those territories to look like. This is the motivation of the South. This was the motivation of secession. They say it in their secession documents, and they say it in their Constitution. This is their motivation. By the end of the 1850s, it's clear what's going to happen. The Union had completely fractured, and Civil War broke out in 1861. Civil War broke out when they seceded. All of these states formed the Confederate States of America and waged war against the Union. I think we know how that story ended. So we're going to go back to the 1850s, but we're going to go to a different geographic location. We're going to come out west. All of this fighting in Congress is taking place about what to do in the west. But instead of waiting for Washington, there's people out here already. And they're a little bit more proactive than Washington is. And they're deciding for themselves how they're going to make this area look. Kansas-Nebraska Act 1854 legally opened this land up to settlement. But before then, there was quite a few people here. Most people would think that this was heavily populated by Euro-Americans. We have our French, Spanish, English, Welsh, Dutch, Ireland, Scottish. Guess who else was out here? Turkish, folks from Bohemia, Mexicans, South Americans. This is in addition to the American Indian that's out here. This is a very, very diverse area at this time. They weren't waiting for Washington, D.C. to dictate what they were going to do with this land. Cities in Europe or the Middle East? Any of those look familiar? Well, yeah, but they're also cities in Nebraska. When folks would come, it was often tradition to name an area after either the capital of the region you came from or after the city that you had come from. So Nebraska was very, very diverse. This is before 1854, when they legally opened up the Nebraska Territory. What were they doing? How were they getting this land? Well, legally in 1854, we'll get back to, 18, back to the 1850s here. We'll pull back to this uh, time period and uh, geographic region. But what they were doing is, after 1854, they were able to acquire land, uh, public land, via the Preemption Act of 1841. This provided actual settlers, notice I say actual settlers, with an opportunity to acquire 160 acres of land for $1.25 an acre. Comes out to about $200. And the condition was you had to begin to improve it. Must provide proof of improvements and pay $1.25 an acre within six months to a year after claiming this. If a settler failed to improve the land, uh, the land would go to auction. It was very, very simple. If you filed a preemption and you failed to prove up on it and paid the money, the land went to auction. Land had to be surveyed. Surveyors are out there, and they are following Thomas Jefferson's guidelines that he outlined in 1785 in the land ordinance, which creates what we all now know as townships and our sections and quarter sections. Um, 160 acres is a quarter section. Notice I said actual settlers. Actual settlers are not speculators. Actual settlers were called squatters. Prior to 1854, 
Oh, that wasn't something you needed. <laughs> Prior to 1854, if you were out here and you were here before surveyors, you were considered what's called a squatter. They had their own way of handling disputes. They didn't have this land mapped under the Jeffersonian land ordinance, so they were operating on a meets and bounds system that says, I'll take the land from the river to the woods over there, or that fence to that fence. So they were not... Uh, they were not as organized as that land ordinance would be. And these disputes over the land uh, and settlement were to be judged by the register of the district. This was also something that would prevent speculation. If speculators came out and you were a squatter and they tried to come onto your land and push you off, they would go to these judges. Oftentimes these judges were subject to bribery, which favored the speculator because the speculator generally had more money in his pocket than the squatter did. In the Nebraska Territory, there were certain associations that formed that allowed the actual settler, uh, that, that protected the actual settler, and they became commonly referred to as claim clubs. This map here is, notice 54, 55, 56, 57. Look how many people are already here. This is Bellevue. These are the sovereign, or these are the squatter sovereigns of Bellevue. That's their claim club name. And notice the dates. There's all those people here already. So Bellevue's already up and running at this time. And they are part of these claim clubs or claim associations. What was a claim club? I mentioned it's designed to promote settlement, protect the squatter, keep speculators away from their territory help solve disputes. This is a claim club in Omaha, and they are outside of a land office doing one of their favorite things, making sure that speculators don't get into that land office. And they would form barriers like that. What else would they do here? Talk about their authority quick. The Territorial Legislature of Nebraska passed an act in 1855 that gave claim clubs the authority to, that allowed them to administer and operate legally within their districts. This was against federal reg legislation that said these organizations are illegal and cannot operate. There were no federal agents out here except for the land agents, and they were not too interested in messing with the claim clubs. And in addition, it said any claimant may protect and defend his possession by the proper civil action. Remember, civil action as we move forward here. These are some of the tactics they would employ. This is a recreation by Solomon Butcher, the Kearney Claim Club, standing outside of a land office. They would place warnings in newspapers. These newspapers would say, Carney Claim Club is going to be at this auction, or they are going to be at this land office on this day. Come at your own risk. They would fill the land office, making it so full that nobody else could get in there to ensure that nobody could come by that land so that nobody could uh, make a claim on that land except for those individuals that were in the claim club. Or they would just fill the streets, as you can see here, making it impossible for anybody to get by. They would set up barricades around the streets <laughs> and make it impossible for anybody to get over it unless you're part of the claim club. And if that didn't work, they would employ more persuasive techniques deemed extra legal, was the term that I have read more often than any. Extra legal. I looked that up in the dictionary and cannot find it. <laughs> but that made it legal-ish, if you will, for them to do some of these other things. This here is a shack that they put together for their own purposes. Often dealing justly but frequently committing wrong. Just but wrong is what he's saying. 
They were just, but they were wrong. They were using intimidation and violence. That was their preferred technique. They would false in prison in those kinds of shacks. They would throw those together and put people in there. Who were they putting in there? Well, they were putting individuals like speculators into these, or they were putting individuals in there that would come behind a squatter who didn't have the money to fund his, um, his preemption claim. So you may have another individual who didn't belong to the claim club come out and make a claim on that land. Odds are he would end up in one of these. Or worse, they would head out in a group, maybe 10, maybe 12, maybe 15, 20, and they would, if you were lucky, pull you out of the house. If not, they were just firing into the house, regardless of who's in there, whether you had a family or not, they're firing into that house. This individual, his name is Callahan. Now this story has been told and told time and time again throughout history and the location changes, uh, the characters involved change, but the situation never changes. So we can safely assume that somewhere something like this had happened. This guy Callahan, comes along and he claims land that a squatter was unable to improve and pay the money required to get the land via preemption. He belonged to, this, the squatter belonged to a claim club. He goes and he tells his president or judge what had happened. So they all go out and they pull Mr. Callahan out of the house and they say, we think it wise if you would relinquish your claim to this land. Callahan says, no. They say, okay. So they tie a noose around his neck and they strap him to the back of a wagon. It's the middle of February. And they take him over to the Missouri River, at which point they cut a hole in the ice. As they're cutting the hole, they say, we think it would be wise if you would relinquish your land. Callahan says, no, you're bluffing. You can see by this picture, they weren't bluffing. They throw him into the eye, or they throw him into the water and they're holding on to that noose. They're holding on to that rope so he doesn't get sucked away. And they pull him up. Mr. Callahan, we think it wise if you would relinquish your land. Shivering, cold, he says, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to give in to you. They put him back in the water. They pull him back out. He is so cold this time when they request that he relinquish his claim that he cannot answer. And that is when the judge says that he made no defense to keep his land. I hereby say this land belongs to this gentleman, the squatter. So... That is the story of Callahan. These are the kind of tactics they would employ. They would string him up by, the, by tree limbs, and when they would just start to pass out, they'd drop him. Relinquish your land. No. Go back up. Until they were unconscious and were unable to put up a defense. The false imprisonment. They would keep him there until these individuals were so starved that they would then just out of sheer hunger, relinquish their claims. Most stories that I did read, though, they were kind enough to feed them afterwards, and then they would send them on their way and tell them, please don't uh, return to this area. <coughs> These are the kind of tactics we're talking about. This is what's happening in the Nebraska Territory at this time. And I say Nebraska Territory, but... I did make this Nebraska-centric, considering my location. This is a template that can be applied in Kansas, in Colorado, in the Dakotas, in Oregon, in New Mexico, in Arizona. This is happening all over the place. This isn't just happening in Nebraska. So these stories are from Nebraska, but this is a organization, uh, organizational uh, techniques that are being employed by these settlers in order to protect their land. 
The behavior was tolerated by the community. Claim clubs were seen as protectors. They were protecting the squatter. They were protecting that honorable individual coming out here attempting to make a living in the land. And they had the interest of the common people in mind. They were supporting the squatter, preventing speculation. And they would march. They would come together and march through these towns and let them know that they were there. They would come together and the Omaha boomers were all over in Oklahoma. They were down there saying, open this land up, open it up. And speculators beware if you show up. They would go around and they would organize these various claim clubs to ensure that they were, their presence was felt in all of these different areas. What about the laws? Where were the laws protecting them? Well, Nebraska, we know what happened. They passed a law saying this is justified. It's extra legal, but it's justified. Claim clubs were the law. They had a judge. They had a judge. They typically had the last say. There was no appeals process. Callahan didn't get to appeal to a territorial governor. Callahan didn't get to appeal to the United States. The only federal authority, as I mentioned before, were the land officers out there. There was no appeals process. This is important. Formal legal institutions had yet to be established. Territorial governments had little authority. They were decoration, primarily. And they were always in constant flux. You go and you look at some place like the Wyoming Territory or the Dakota Territory. In the matter of five years, their territorial government may have changed five different times, four different times. So who they were speaking to, who their people could appeal to, was never consistent. The claim clubs were consistent. Those legal institutions had not been formed. And those land officers, they had little interest in settling any disputes. They could care less. The more paperwork they filed, the better. They were getting paid by the file, or by filing. That's how land officers made their money. So the more uh, paper they pushed, the more dollars they made. And your surveyors, all they were doing was trying to get the survey taken care of, get those books created to get back to the land officers. What brought the Claim Club era to an end? 37th Congress. Here in 1862, the South had seceded, and we have a Northern Congress that is made up of primarily Lincoln Republicans. Another one of my favorite pictures. Sorry to keep cramming those on you. They passed three pieces of legislation that really bring about the beginning of the end for these claim clubs. The Pacific Railway Act of 1862 creates the legislation necessary to uh, build a transcontinental railroad, creates the Union Pacific, provides millions and millions of acres of public land to be sold by those railroads to raise the funds necessary to build that uh, transcontinental railroad. So the federal government is moving into this area. They're going to start building a railroad, which means they're going to start bringing people out here by rail. The Morrill College Act, also 1862 gave away 30,000 acres of land per representative in Congress to each state. So if you had three representatives in Congress, maybe two senators and one uh, House representative, then you would have 90,000 acres of public land to be sold to the public. And whatever you raise from this, uh, from this piece of legislation, you were then to use those funds to build what are now traditionally called our land-grant colleges. And our states, our A&Ms, our University of Nebraska, our land-grant colleges. So we're going to educate you. We're going to take you there, and we're going to educate you. The purpose of these were, these colleges were to apply the agricultural and mechanical arts and sciences to education. 
in order to generate new research. They're coming to the Great Plains. Great Plains doesn't look a whole lot like Massachusetts. Doesn't look a whole lot like New York. So we need to educate. We need research. And then they passed the Homestead Act of 1862. So we're going to take you there on a rail. We're going to educate you. And then we're going to give you 160 acres of land. Talking about a pretty good deal. Well, the end of the Claim Club era is spelled out in this legislation. Because when you bring people out here, when you give them land and you show them how to work it, they're going to stay. When they stay, the population grows. Those populations uh, are then become uh, high enough that they're able to apply for statehood, at which point they are now represented in Congress. One of the biggest fears of the South was that right there. The South wanted to extend their slave economy, their slaveocracy out into these territories, and they wanted to populate this area because it was all about getting the people out there so that way they could ultimately apply for statehood and have political representation. These are very, very northern ideals. All of these pieces of legislation were on the table prior to secession. All of them were blocked prior to secession. The 37th Congress, after they got the war machine up and running, looked around and said, nobody's here to stop us. Let's pass some of this legislation. Let's get northern sympathizers into the western territory so that way even if we lose, even if we lose, the people that are going out there are going to be sympathetic to our ideology, which is ultimately going to politically uh, be advantageous to them years to come. Amazing forethought by the 37th Congress. They spell it out in their debates when they're talking about this. But why is this in the claim club era? Well, if we think about why claim clubs were able to operate, if you think about what was their basis of power, is that there were no formal legal institutions at this time. And without formal legal institutions, these extra legal <clears throat> thugs were able to run around and pretty much do whatever they wanted. Now you have a Homestead Act that's bringing these people out here, and look at this stat. Between 1860 and 1870, 100,000 people came to Nebraska. Became the 37th state in 1867. Well, when you have a state, you have obviously enough people here to build towns. You have enough people here to create a state legislature. And you have enough people here to create those legal institutions. These folks who were being uh, targeted by these claim clubs, because it wasn't just speculators that were being targeted by claim clubs. It was anybody who didn't belong to the claim club. So whether you wanted to participate or not in uh, farming as a actual settler, you had to have belonged to one of these claim clubs. So they didn't have appeals process. They didn't have anybody else to turn to. So these legal institutions gave them that, uh, that authority that they needed and gave them a, uh, a, a police force to go to, gave them a judge outside of the claim club judge that was going to pass their, uh, pass their verdict upon them. And they were going to be able to be tried by a jury not just tried at the end of a noose by a group of individuals that were going to ensure they got their way one way or the other. So you have the end of the claim club era coming in 1862. Most of our claim clubs are gone from the Great Plains by the end of the 1860s. Very, very short-lived duration. Very short and you have a group of individuals left in, most of them 
had the land that they were looking for, but you have a group of individuals left that wrote a few of these stories down for us and were able to look at it and see they were more proactive than uh, our friends back in Washington. Although Washington, a few of those uh, congressmen, I think, would have fit right in with some of these claim clubs after seeing the violence that uh, was ensuing on the floor of Congress. So the Homestead Act, Pacific Railway Act, and the Morrill Act are really responsible for the end of this era. On behalf of Homestead National Monument of America, I thank you all. Do we have any questions? Yeah. Where did that energy go, the, the Claims Club fellows' energy? Where did it go? Did it go to another group? It went to what we would call cattle associations. Okay. <laughs> and um, <laughs> the, these individuals, uh, as the further west you went, um, in the slower progress of civilization, you had this whole high plains or, uh, economy of cattle ranching, free ranging. And when homesteaders and civilization started to encroach on their territory, well, they were employing a lot of those same tactics that the claim clubs were originally employing. Theirs lasted even shorter in that civilization moved a lot faster, or uh, the U.S. civilization moved a lot faster out there. So that would be my answer as to where that was transferred. Any other questions? In eastern, yeah. in eastern Nebraska, people were still, there was still land available to homestead in like 1878 and times like that? In places, there was in eastern Nebraska. Eastern Nebraska is really a uh, unique place in that all of that legislation that I put up there was available in eastern Nebraska and all of it was uh, administered in eastern Nebraska, but you also had a lot of selling of land going on by the government at this time as well. So it was really dependent upon where, now down in Gage County where Homestead National Monument's at, that was primarily sold off. And then you have areas around Omaha and on further that followed the Transcontinental Railroad that area was primarily sold off every other section at a time. And then inside of those sections that were, or inside of that every other section checkerboard that was given to the railroads, you see some homesteading by Union soldiers at first because uh, it wasn't just opened up to homesteading everywhere near those railroads. You had to have been either a Union soldier or you had to buy that land directly for the government. So um, you see a good mix all over in eastern Nebraska. So everything was happening at once here. And then I have up in the Sandhills some 1891. See, the Sandhills, uh, they, they were interesting in their own right. Uh, 1891, yes, that would have been homesteading. Uh, and they found it so difficult in the Sandhills that uh, actually in 1904 they passed what was called the Kincaid Act that uh, gave away a whole section, 640 acres, to individuals that uh, were willing to go out there with the same requirements of homesteading, but you just got more land because of the aridity of the land in the area out there. Yeah. Minor question, but you mentioned 160 acres uh, being the uh, entirety of the homestead. Uh, were there not smaller parcels homesteaded as well? You, you could actually get up to 160 acres under the 1862 legislation, up to 160 acres. If you want to do homestead 40, 80, 120, you were more than welcome to. So, and you had to do it in 40 acre parcels. So 160 was the max. Yeah. Was Nebraska more settled by land bought from the railroad or by the homestead? Uh, it would have been the railroad, honestly. The railroad in, uh, in 1864, there was an act passed called an act to encourage immigration. And what this act did was it was a government subsidized uh, marketing campaign 
to encourage railroads to go overseas and get uh, European immigrants to come to the United States and settle. And they, it was kind of a interesting contradiction because they were telling them, tell them about the free land. Well, you had just given the railroads millions of acres to sell. So you would see these beautiful advertisements saying, come to America, look at the land for, or for cheap is what they're saying. And then at the very bottom of a lot of these advertisements, it says, oh yeah, there's homestead land available too. <laughs> so um, it, it, it was interesting, but the railroads were the primary uh, real estate agents at this time, and they were selling large swaths of land. Three minutes. In, in follow up to his question, um, the railroads got what, 10 miles on, on each side, a 20 mile swath in checkerboard fashion or something? Yes. Along rivers, and so it'd be the prime land in the state. <laughs> so the Homestead Act got the crummy land away from rivers and railroads? Yes, in a sense to answer that. But um, Eastern Nebraska, once again, they had 10 miles on each side, so it was 20 miles. But the more arid regions, the, especially out in the sand hills and then even further west, they were getting 20 miles on each side. So, um, but it was every other section, and initially it wasn't opened up to homesteading. But homesteading in, the vari or in those various areas eventually came online because the railroads, no ma even though they were selling large amounts of land, they weren't able to sell it fast enough. And in order to be economically viable, because they made their money not through land, they were making their money through goods and services. And uh, when they were not able to sell that land fast enough, those railroads backed off and gave uh, and opened that land up to homesteaders because they needed people. People were the pe uh, what, how you generated funds. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about school lands. School schools actually were part of that uh, land ordinance of eighteen or seventeen eighty five. Uh, when you created a township a section was uh, typically dedicated to public education, to build a school. That's what they wanted. Or are you talking about uh, the Morrill Act? Well, they're um, a section. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that was actually generated back uh, with that land ordinance of Thomas Jefferson's uh, 1785, and then followed up with the uh, land ordinance of uh, 1787, where they actually applied that to the Ohio Valley and uh, were able to create that section within the townships. Are there still those sections in the state? Uh, that it seems to me that... Uh, the school that they were allowed to sell some of that land. Well, uh, yeah, it's that that's really a locality issue. Um, I don't know. I know a lot of school districts, especially recently, have combined and those kinds of things, especially in our rural communities where uh, a lot of the population has uh, left those areas. So it's really a locality issue. It's not federally administered anymore. Yeah. This land giveaway. Uh, was primarily for the first railroad coming through or for some of the branches that followed through the years? It, it, it really, the more, or the Pacific Railway Act was directly targeted at uh, the Transcontinental Railroad, but they didn't stop there. We're talking billions of acres were given away to railroads. Uh, the, the, as the land spider webbed, the only state that I know of that didn't do this was uh, North Dakota. And, uh, but every other area, they had massive swaths of land given to those railroads. So how many years did this go on? Uh, essentially into the early 20th century. So about the late 18, 1890s, it's really starting to uh, cease because it's, ineffective. It, it's not raising any money. And those land grants were supposed to actually have been paid back to the government. And a lot of those uh, railroads issued uh, stock prior to a lot of the congressmen and things of that nature in order to uh, have confidence in their railroads, but uh, they, they failed. It looked a lot like uh, the tech industry in the 90s, so uh, they were failing quite often. Yeah. Last question. Uh, how did the opening of the West 
through the, the railroads, through, through legislation, and the whole issue of the Indian population. How did that all work out? <laughs> what, what, what took place? Uh, that's a big question, but how did the government deal with the Indian population? Removal and assimilation. Yeah. Those so sorry. Removal and assimilation. You remove and you uh, try to assimilate. Uh, that's the reservation system. That's what was going on. And uh, they, that is the easiest way to say, or that's the simplest way to say it, is just removal and assimilation. That was their policy. I want to thank you guys so much. You've been wonderful. Thank you.